Welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Odd Gurvin. I'm project manager at the Norwegian Cognitive Center. Uh, today, we are going to meet uh, three very different companies. One, a company who has uh, a new way of doing business process management by using AI uh, to interview thousands of workers. We have one company that have an AI solution that counts sea lice and accurately measure biomass at, in real time using AI. And we have a consulting company delivering AI competence to some of the world's biggest brands. Uh, thank you for uh, doing this with us. Um, all these uh, um, different cases has uh, uh, different solutions that really change the way we work today. So uh, I'm excited to hear the presentation. Mm, after the presentation, we will have a Q&A. Uh, so just send uh, your questions uh, in the chat while one of those are presenting and we ask them directly after or wait until uh, the end of all the presentation. Uh, we do the Q&A together. Um, the presentations will also be uh, posted on a blog uh, uh, within the end of the week and we also record this uh, session. Uh, I'll just start with a short briefing of who we are and what we do. Uh, uh, Norwegian Cognitive Center is a consortium uh, with all these uh, participants within. Here is uh, uh, cluster companies. Here are IBM as a, our uh, technology partner. We have research institution, we had academia and uh, health uh, and different um, uh, public sector um, who has partnered up with us. Uh, the idea behind the center is that there is a huge um, demand of the AI competence. This, uh, at the same time, there is a, a, um, a big, um, uh, there is necessary for a lot of organizations starting to use AI. And this is not a cross-sector challenge. Uh, this is a cross-sector challenge. So we decided that we all go together to, uh, to uh, provide infrastructure in terms of personnel, know-how, and AI platforms. And uh, we have des uh, designed a program for enhanced uh, product development and scale up the AI development. So the company can transform products, transform operation enterprises or user experience. So uh, they can develop competitive advantages for themselves. Our offering is uh, uh, all this. Uh, you can use ABM, uh, IBM Watson uh, free in the period in the project we offering uh, AI competence free of charge a long way uh, through the process. We have a learning area who is a a arena with uh, this is one of uh, those. We also help uh, um, uh, organizations with uh, um, um, applying for public funding. We have a guidelines uh, uh, for how you should develop AI and contracts we can help you with. We also have a lab you can work in. And we have a program, startup accelerator program, one uh, for IB, uh, for, uh, through IBM and another one to be Nora. Uh, we also uh, help organization make contact with uh, PhD, uh, bachelor students, master students, etc., who they can use in their project. And we also have a garish method uh, um, exploring opportunities uh, to different uh, companies and also have AI offering AI competence to a, to a, a highly reduced cost. So that's short about us. Uh, if we start with uh, Johan, welcome to you. If you start your presentation and do your magic. 
Hello there, and thank you for having me. I'm really excited to share uh, what we've been working on. So I will just share my screen and um, start my presentation. So uh, we are Grid AI. We are a um, um, AI company, but basically we are a process company. So my name is Johan Vedel. I have a background in process management and project management from digitization projects. And we are a company with where we do all in-house uh, development, uh, but we also have uh, a team uh, abroad. And uh, yeah, we're a, a bunch of people trying to improve processes. So, but, um, so what I'm gonna try to do today is to show you the domain that we're working in, as well as our, uh, what kind of problem we are solving. And if I have the time, I will show you the product and a little bit of a demo. We only have 15 minutes, so I'll try to, to uh, put everything into this uh, presentation. So what domain are we working in? Uh, well, it's basically digital transformation. Uh, it's, um, it's a huge focus area for both private and public sector. And basically digital transformation is not only putting electricity on paper. We are, it's, it's, also about the processes of the company. If you're buying a new ERP system or if you're uh, integrating a new software that will help you do something uh, that, to improve efficiency, you also need to change the processes. So this is the domain that we were working in. And we, we saw that the key methods for this domain hasn't changed really for 20 years. It's, um, I, I, will, I will come back to a little bit more of the details on this, but basically what we saw, we wanted to create a product that was in the range of the 10X and cheaper, uh, meaning that we want to give the customers 10 times the value and we want to do it cheaper than what is done today. So, but what is really the problem here? What's the problem with digital transformation? I think everyone that's worked on a project that's, that involves uh, digital transformation uh, knows that it takes a lot of time and it costs a lot of money. So our best um, example of this is actually, um, it's an industry, the oil industry that went to uh, massive changes when the prices dropped. Um, they saw that they needed, there was a local company called National Oil Well Varco down here in the south of Norway. And what they did was they wanted a new ERP system that would integrate all of the parts of their company. There were 5,000 employees and the processes were, were you know, messy. It wasn't a continuity in how they operate. So, but, uh, so we had um, actually in my master studies, we had uh, uh, the project manager of, of this, um, this project explaining that they spent five years and, and 160 million Norwegian kroner uh, buying the system and doing the whole project. Well, what interested us were, were that they spent three years, out of those five years, they spent three years and 100 million Norwegian kroner, estimately, uh, on doing only the discovery and model part of the of the process. And this was because they needed a lot of consultants to go... Uh, uh, you, you want, uh, sorry, I'm... Um, uh, do you know that your presentation is not... Uh, we don't see it? Oh, you don't? No. <laughs> Oh, yeah, all right. So I was a little bit excited there. So I will just uh, share my screen. Sorry. So um, uh, do you see my screen now? Yes. All right. So the slides you missed was, was this one, <laughs> this one for me, and then the area we're working in a digital transformation. So um, all right. So the, the problem, uh, as I mentioned, this, this company, they have, they spent 100 million and three years to um, to um, uh, to get this project started, to do a discovery phase, and also to model all of the um, all the processes that they needed in order to implement this new ERP system. So this was a huge problem. Why is this ta this taking so long? And in in my model here, the average uh, project it takes uh, 10 to 14 months just to do a discovery and a model. Um, to, to create models of the, of the processes. So what we thought was that what if we can apply AI uh, to uh, perform some of these tasks so that it can go, it can be performed faster. This, this would solve huge problems when it comes to transformation and uh, allow more companies to actually um, have the possibility to, to, um, uh, to start their projects and to finish uh, faster. 
uh, and etc. So we wanted to create a kind of a digital robot, a, a digital twi twin of the um, of the consultant, if you will. So um, uh, we started building this on the IBM Watson platform. Um, we uh, but really AI today wasn't. Um, it wasn't built to serve this type of product because it's it's never been done before. So we had to re-engineer how IBM Watson was, but the platform was very agile. So there was no problem really to, well, I I'm under uh, uh, undermining it. It's, it. It was a huge problem, but it, we managed to go through it. So, um, but we were able to create a, a AI that was able to perform the interviews that were previously done manually. And this reduced um, the, the time ab with about 94% from mm -hmm. the time you, you started doing the project until you had uh, an as-is model of how the processes were, were, uh, were, uh, um, were um, in place. So, um, so this resulted in a product we call GridGo. Um, it's a software as a service. I, I won't go too much into the details of the, the product. I'm not here to do a sales pitch on it. But basically, we have uh, three parts of the product. That's a, and the most powerful part, part is the discovery uh, phase, where we have the digital ro robots, which, of course, as all digital robots, they are un unlimited in resources. They don't drink coffee, they don't uh, take vacation, they don't get sick, and um, uh, it's it's quite um, uh, so. Uh, the power of AI is, of course, to do all of the repetitive work that you're able to do it, um, have a computer to do it, and then um, uh, really speed things up. So uh, we, of course, also have a modeling tool uh, for building and visualizing the processes. And then soon we are releasing an app so that the, the AI will also be able to give you information about the processes that you as an employee um, uh, are a part of. So um, then I will... I see I have, I've spent seven minutes. So I will uh, then change the screen sharing over to the demo so that you can see this live. Because one thing is talking about AI. What we are really concerned about, or what we are, um, uh, we think is important is that we see applied AI. Because there's a lot of talk about, you know, the possibilities of AI, but you're really supposed to see uh, the potential and how it's, how it operates. So um, I will now share the screen with uh, a demo that we have. Now, this is, uh, bear in mind, this is just a demo. We can't show any live uh, customers, um, but this is the interface of how you can manage all of the processes. So uh, as an example here, you have um, this uh, process here, which is booking and boarding a flight. And uh, so if I'm a consultant and I, and I need to, normally I would go to the clients, I would meet maybe two or three of key people working with this process uh, and, and asking them, you know, sitting in hours of interviews, they have to leave their work. And it's, it's a huge process, a huge cost. And uh, what I, well, how we change this with AI is then that we just uh, add the employee here and then we do nothing. We just wait. And now the employee, they will receive the invitation and they will go to a chat interface. Oh, this is on on uh, on a PC, but um, it's uh, it's um, uh, just one moment here. Maybe the invitation hasn't gone out. Uh, let's see here. So normally, when we um, so they will then invite the the person. And yeah, that's typical. Uh, um, <laughs> that actually never happened. So um, uh, that, that's live demo. It's live demo. This this has never uh, happened before. As you can see, it it, it I've I've used this before, so that it might might be the reason. But um, I was doing testing on this earlier. So um, so uh, now it's. Um, So, um, and then they st it starts interviewing the, the employee about the process. And then uh, it gives, everyone gets a tutorial in, in the beginning uh, of how to discuss, but basically they are ready to start the discussion within like three minutes of the first time they are entering the program. So um, if I'm then, um, uh, let's say I have this, uh, this flight, uh, booking and boarding a flight, 
And um, so uh, at the beginning of this would be the customer sends an email booking a flight. Uh, and then it will respond, okay, so what happens after it's sent? Uh, now, this is uh, typically how a conversation would normally go with, with one of the, uh, that we would do in a meeting, but there's also uh, some, some guidance. So let's say they say something like they receive the order in a booking system. Well, who is they? So you should, they, I should be picking up on this to, to also give uh, some information about that. But also, uh, and this is all determined by, you know, how you would, um, you know, AI with um, natural language understanding is to, to pick apart a sentence and then analyze it so that you can give a better feedback. Um, and then, for example, this is a good example of that. If the order is approved, then it is stored, for example. And then it's, the AI will tell you that it looks like you're just driving a step that can, a step that can, can have two different outcomes. So this is a, a, an example of, of how, uh, instead of kind of a, a typical, you know, this is the difference between a conversational AI and the typical chatbot. So, but basically what we're doing is we're re-engineering how chat, chatbots work so that they can give information into a system like this. So uh, then we go into the modeling tool here and then we can see the process and it's already been classified by the AI. So our future feature will actually be that uh, the AI will build a model for you. So, um, so, but the consultant will then uh, just uh, go here, they will add employees and then they will go into the modeling tool and start uh, creating the model and how um, it should um, uh, appear. So that's basically how we uh, were able to, with this simple process, I will, it's quite difficult to, to build, but it's uh, with this simple um, way of just applying AI, suddenly the consultant, especially now in these uh, COVID times, um, uh, you, the consultant no longer has to go out and visit just key people you can add 100 people for the ai to interview and you could start interviewing in an entire enterprise of thousands of users if you want to uh, and that's really um a huge change from how it was done before we had to manually travel to the customer and then um and then do one-on-one -on -one interviews or huge seminars or etc cetera, etc cetera. so um we actually had a consultancy agency verify the quality of of the outcome of the system and it was actually of a higher quality than what was was normal in these projects so that that's uh, that's how we use ai to to um uh to uh um in, to make a change in how uh, consultants work and also uh, in the next run, also uh, improve digital transformation and also in the end change how people actually work in the workplace. Because the, the main objective here is to collect how the process is done today to may then create new versions of how it's supposed to become um, so that everyone stops doing repetitive tasks and yeah. All right, so um, that's... Uh... That's my presentation. I think um, if we're looking at time. Thank um, you very much, uh, Johan. Um, uh, there were no questions in the chat yet, but you will, will wait until the end and ask. Uh, people can ask questions later on. Uh, Vidar, could you please share your presentation and do yes, your surely. magic? Surely, surely, surely. I will try to do so. Uh, but then I, 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 I kind of rely on you on to tell me if it shows yes or no. It shows. <laughs> it shows good. So we can keep with that. Um, thank you for for uh, for letting me do the presentation. I have one problem, and that is that I would like to talk for about two to three hours. So um, <laughs> I'm going to solve it by trying to to uh, talk quick. So, um, but um, as I understand that the audience to call you this. Um, isn't that all, all that familiar with the fish farming industry? I'll give some background information before I go into how we kind of solve it uh, in, in Aquabyte. Um, sorry to say, I'm not a techni technician. I'm not into the algorithms very deeply. Uh, what I do is more sales and marketing, uh, but I kind of got a good understanding of the fish farming industry as such over the years since I started Fish Farmer in 1987. But um, I'll... Um, Let's just see if we can, how do we do this? Yeah. Now, this is a picture of a fish farm, just like a standard fish farm. This is north of Bergen. 
Um, and I'll, I'm going to explain it like this. In each of these circular cages, there is about 800 tons of salmon uh, at the maximum point of time. Um, it's inserted there, at the, let's, let's say like in the size of 100 grams and it grows up to, let's say four kilos, five kilos, six kilos, depending on uh, several factors. Uh, you can see in the background, there's uh, what we call a feeding barge containing feed silos and feeding uh, systems. Peter, sorry to interrupt, but we don't see any cages. You don't see any cages. Hmm. Thank you. I'll just, just go forward here again. Uh, see. Uh, I'll just stop the share, try again. Is this the kind of demonstration devil this haunting us again? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's see. Um, I'll do a quick move back here. Normally, you could say that the uh, like um, um, that the um, as, as being a representative from a software company, this shouldn't be a problem. Hmm. So, all the way, this always happens. Now, I'm going to try again to uh, a new share. Um, so, please let me know if you can see the screen now. We see the screen. All right. And then let's see if we can do the next one. Can you see the next one as well? Yes. Fantastic. Now you now you can see the cages, and you can also see the feed the the, the feed barge I, I was mentioning uh, uh, recently. Now um, I, I think what, what you can um, well I, I'll just go on and um, say something about the background for what why we're doing aquaculture. You can see clearly that the uh, as everybody knows the the, the wild catch is limited, um, and in order to feed the world, you need to to have more proteins available. Um, aquaculture is seen as being the one that's going to, to help out with the protein gap, as we call it. Uh, and it's also a lot more sustainable, as everybody knows. Um, I'm not going to go into to, to details on the, on the sustainability and the goals and all this, uh, but um, uh, clearly um, to produce fish is a smart way to, to feed people. So with an Aquabyte, what we do now is, uh, is presenting biomass and average weight. Biomass is the sum of the weight of the fish in, in a given pen or in a given uh, enclosure. Uh, we also do count sea lice uh, automatically, as, as earlier mentioned. Uh, we're also looking into fish welfare and also trying to identify the um, the unique fish in order to, to prevent double counting and those problems. Uh, I think most of the value in future will be within the anal analytic world, uh, telling the fish farmer a lot more about the situation he can't see. Problem about farming fish instead of cattle or sheep or whatever you do is that the fish is underwater and it's very, very difficult to get to speak to you or tell you things. So you can see that it lives and it grows or it dies or, or having a disease. Um, in, in, in relation to a cattle where you can see it and hear it and, and, and eventually um, have an earlier warning. Um, the company Aquabyte has now offices in Chile, uh, in South America, where also in, in San Francisco, in Silicon Valley, where it's founded and in Bergen, Norway, as the being the salmon capital of the world, as we like to see it. Uh, the combination is uh, about 50-50 US and, uh, and Norway, where in the US we got the tech environment, uh, obviously from Silicon Valley. And in Norway, we have the more the fish farming biology and, 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 and on hands capabilities. Uh, from the tech nerds amongst you, you could find that, a, um, for instance, Amazon has a great interest in Aquabyte, which is quite fun. Uh, from the financial uh, perspective, it's been, uh, it's been a quite a fast train moving and, and also uh, been adding up to what I now think is in the region of $20 million in financing. So there's a lot of people out there that believes in, in aquaculture being the future uh, protein source, which is the background of it all. Uh, we have, um, well, this is in Norwegian, so I'll, I'll just skip it. I'll go into the technical part. What you see to, uh, on the right hand is the camera, one of the cameras we're using. 
um, on the outer edges, uh, it is uh, light as you need underwater. Um, what you see in the middle is two cameras, which is stereo cameras giving you the same perspective as you have with your eyes. Uh, that makes it uh, possible to, to do uh, like uh, depth tracking and also size of fish, which is quite important for us. Um, we, we do some of the calculations, some of the algorithms are run within the, the, the camera in, in a separate computer and we, we take it to the, sky, to, the, uh, to the cloud and do more uh, processing there. But you, you, you can imagine that's a lot of processing going on. We're taking in, in average one picture per second. So it's, uh, it's a lot of pixels. Um, the algorithms will see like, uh, like this. This is a sizing of the of fish. Um, and it will be identifying the different parts of the fish, helping us to see how big the fish, uh, fish are. Um, you can see we have processed images of, uh, well, it says on one uh, or uh, 108 million fish at this time. Uh, we're now about 125. So it's, uh, we're getting there. Um, the, the point is that if, you, if you're doing this within the working hours, it would take you like 90 years to do it. And that is really the, the, the benefits of the AI part here. So by, uh, by learning the algorithms, how to, how to play, we're, we're actually um, being able to process a lot more data than it was possible to do before, uh, as you all know, of course. Um, just, just, uh, just thinking of doing this, uh, it, it, even, even um, 24 seven, it's just like more than 20 years. So what, would, what do we do? We, we kind of measure the fish so we can tell you how big the, your fish is in, in average. Uh, we can also give you the distribution of the fish, which is very important for, uh, for you at the time of, for instance, selling the fish. If you know how big the fish are, uh, you can sell it when the price for the different weight buckets are at the, at the, right, uh, at the right moment. Um, so we give you, it. Uh, I'll just show you here, we, we give you this uh, fish identity uh, part uh, in, in addition that will help you to, uh, to uh, how can you put that, uh, to, to take out the possibility that we double count it. So if you see, see these graphs with the fish ID, you'll get a lot more accurate uh, number of the fish rather than if you didn't have it, because some of the fish would eventually pass by the camera once or, two, once or twice, or maybe near three times. Um, we're also able to, to identify subpopulations of the fish. This is maybe a bit technical for the fish farming population, so to say, but if you can see the lower blue uh, dots, they are kind of, uh, um, they kind of uh, uh, position themselves away from the green dots, which is the majority of the, of the population of the pen. So we can actually tell the fish farmer that as a population, there's a subpopulation of his pen which has a lot lower average weight than the rest of the, of the population. Uh, so instead of waiting until the harvesting point of time and uh, by thinking that you, if you have the average uh, weights of the fish to be like four kilos, it turned out they were three and a half uh, and it's a lot lower. And in addition, you have a lot of fish that's uh, is not, uh, of superior quality. Um, I'm also kind of just, just reaching out to you to see um, how easy is it? Uh, and it, this is a bit meant to, to, to well, not make, make things problematic, but you can see how, how, uh, how we do it. Um, our camera would identify, and the software would identify the number of fishes in the picture uh, within like a millisecond. We would use a lot more time. Um, this is a picture of a sea lice and you can see it in the front of the, of the of the, of the pen, um, it's maybe like two millimeters long and it's been discovered by the camera while as the fish is just swimming by. Um, you can also see from, um, from the different uh, or from other uh, diseases and, and things you need to, to check out for, we can, we can detect it, we can count it, we can measure it by, by just applying algorithms to, to, uh, to the cameras. Uh, we also do 
the accuracy part of, uh, of fish, given that the, the population of the fish is where it should be, or the camera is where the fish are at, uh, we, can, we can guarantee like 98% accuracy of the number. Uh, and keep in mind that the pens are uh, 51 meters in circumference and have a depth of my, maybe 50 meters as well, and has a population of 150 to 200,000 fish. So given a 98% accurate, accurate number over time in realistic conditions or in real time conditions are hard to tell you that. Um, we're also working with the, with the trout, which is uh, what used to be called the rainbow trout. Now um, that has a different shape. So it takes a bit longer to train the algorithms to it, but we're, we're, um, we're at or close to 98%, but we're not ready to give you the guarantee yet. For the lice counting, um, it's been a kind of a kind of a run for several several uh, uh, companies now to to have everything approved. Um, an update now is that uh, there is two fish farmers that had applied for and and received uh, um, a dispensation to count automatically with our system. Now the the, the for a fish farming. Uh, company, they need to count sea lice manually on the fish every week from every pen. So you can you can imagine that that's a very tedious work and it, it takes a lot of time to do and it was also a hassle for the fish. So um, this is kind of another area of utilizing the, um, the, the the technology that will help the fish a lot because it's uh, it's uh, it's troublesome to be to be captured, of course. This, um, there's also, of course, for you, for you technology guys, um, there is all this image processing is taking a lot of capacity. It's uh, it's quite um, it, it's quite demanding, um, and if you can see 10 million images a day, um, that's only with 10 farms, and you could just add up. There is uh, around about 800 farms in Norway alone. Uh, not not thinking about the rest of the world. So there is. Uh, capacity is is an issue. Also, that is some of the reason for why we we have uh, have uh, implemented a, a computer into the camera submerged just to to help out. So um, finally, the, just getting back to the to the overall goal um, to feed a lot of people, we need a lot of food. We need a lot of protein, and we're kind of helping out on this matter. Thank you, that's all for me. Thank you so much, Vidar. Uh, very interesting. And I also see that uh, uh, what you have done is uh, of great value to <laughs> other uh, um, similar projects, not within uh, fishing, but other uh, sectors also. Uh, you, uh, you like to start? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see you, but uh, we don't see your presentation. All right, okay, bear with me one second. Um, bear with. Okay, hopefully you can now see that. Yes, we see that in full screen. Excellent, cool. Okay, so, um, First of all, uh, oh, thanks very much for, for having us. We're delighted to be to be part of the uh, the A and I Inspire webinar. Um, I know we've only got fifteen minutes, so we're gonna we're gonna crack on. <clears throat> so, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Hugh Perry. Um, I'm the VP for Connected and Intelligent Solution Sales at Mobica, uh, and I have my lovely colleague Shabak on the call, um, who's one of our senior. Uh, technology architects. Uh, he's based in Poland. So a little bit about Mobica before we uh, before we crack on. So Mobica are a global software services company. Um, it's always important for me to say at this stage that we don't own software, we don't own any IP. Uh, we just co-develop and innovate with customers. Um, around their software development requirements. So we have a large bunch of very highly technical um, 
software engineers who are based all over the world. Um, and we've been co-developing and innovating with our customers uh, within the AI field uh, and its disciplines of machine learning and deep learning um, across the globe for a while. So we're looking forward to bringing that experience to the table uh, in Norway. So we've established that we don't own any software. We don't sell software. Uh, we just have a whole bunch of very, very cool software engineers. You can see on the right hand side, some of the uh, um, brands that we work with across the globe. Um, so we really help out. We help our customers by providing software engineering at scale. Um, so when, the, when they are struggling and they have a challenge internally uh, to create code just to get them to market, um, we will help them on that journey. Um, and we can either do that in some of our development centers, which are based in Poland or uh, Germany or the UK or the US. Um, and in some cases we have our own um, dedicated um, areas where we will work on site with the customer. So in terms of our, in terms of our focus, we really, we really work in three different sectors. Um, automotive is, is a massive opportunity for us. There's, there's a huge transformation going on there. We're working with you know, some big, big brands that you recognize, the likes of BMW and Audi, and we're speaking to the usual suspects there. Um, and we're helping them shape what's going to be going on, you know, in their cars, you know, in, in the next five years. So it's really exciting, uh, which is why we have a dedicated presence now in, in Munich, in Germany, where we're engaged directly with these guys. Um, we also work uh, very closely with some of the silicon vendors. So Intel uh, and Arm are two of our very large accounts. And to put it into perspective, you know, we've been working with Intel for over 10 years and um, you know we are a very trusted partner with those guys so again when they're developing the silicon in terms of the next generation chips and stuff uh, and what that can bring to the table we're, we're helping them on that journey um, and then the final sector that which is what I work in from a sales perspective is, is connected devices and this is really interesting because uh, it encompasses a whole different bunch of, of areas um, so we're not just specifically dealing with media companies, we're speaking to telcos, we're speaking to fintech, we're speaking to connected health. Uh, so because all of that, all of that industry experience is cross industry experience. So whatever we're doing, you know, in automotive, whatever we're doing in silicon, whatever we're doing in connected health, we can bring that into a company that might be um, shipping in Norway and they're looking at um, IoT. So, you know, it's all cross functional stuff. So we just touched on this very quickly. We have a big presence in, in uh, Poland. Uh, so we have several offices over there where most of the engineers are based. Uh, our head HQ uh, is in Wilmslow, which for those of you who aren't familiar with the uh, geography uh, of the UK, it's based a short train ride north of Manchester. Um, Munich obviously is, is in Germany where all the, all the car manufacturers and OEMs are. And then we have uh, some, um, we have some presence in, in the west coast of the US. So before we talk specifically about AI, um, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Shamek, who's going to talk to you very quickly about some of our cross-industry cross experience um, in these three different sectors that we mentioned. And then we'll talk about the AI stuff. And then obviously we'd be delighted to answer any questions that you might have at the end of the presentation, which is probably for about another 10 minutes looking at the uh, looking at the timing. So um, over to you, uh, Shemek. Uh, thank you, Hugh. Uh, can you release the sharing? Do you want me to do it? Yeah. Uh, no, 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 it just says stop, stop sharing. Yeah, sure, okay, one sec. Uh, there we go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, is my screen seen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So again, thank you all for having us here. Um, uh, my name is Shmek Rokos and I'm a technical solution architect at Mobica. Uh, we've been, been 10 years with Mobica and seen many different things with um, 
many of those customers that uh, that you has uh, has presented. I will not go into too much detail in terms of uh, our major sectors. Uh, the the major point uh, around those sectors is that we manage uh, them according to uh, our processes or processes belonging to our customers. We just don't want to be disruptive by by doing the work. And one more a factor is that uh, the silicon and technology platforms uh, sector often provides enablement or platform uh, capability onto to other sectors. So the things that we do in silicon sector sometimes have uh, direct uh, direct follow up in, uh, for example, connected uh, the connected devices. So, for example, with uh, Movidius, uh, Intel Movidius, we do the platform development uh, with with these guys. At the same time, we do the applications, for example, with Flare. Uh, uh, running a Movidius platform. So today, um, because there's so little time available, uh, let me start just with the anecdote. Before an actual machine learning problem is solved, the scientists call it AI problem, but uh, once it is solved, uh, they call it just mere automation, which is a bit funny because uh, nothing has changed uh, about the problem itself. So you definitely remember the old uh, days with uh, uh, where the Kasparov was beaten by Deep Blue from IBM. Before it was just uh, AI, sophisticated AI, and afterwards it was just a brute force uh, finding the best uh, move out of, uh, of out of possible domain. So let me start with uh, my favorite uh, quote from Professor Andrew Ench, uh, the AI researcher from uh, from Stanford also co-founder of Coursera. Uh, the AI is, AI is the new electricity and I really like this comparison because it demystifies the AI, it emphasizes its universal benefits. So current AI is just a tool and not just some sort of genie, some, someone to portrait it, it just magnifies human capabilities. So once uh, Steve Jobs said that computers are like a bicycle for the mind, so in my opinion, the AI just adds a powerful engine to that bike. Um, well, before you actually start doing anything with the AI or machine learning, you really, really need to set your expectations right. And this sometimes is a bit painful experience. So you really need to sift out all the hype and just look at the, the basic facts that, that's, uh, that are related to that technology. So adding machine learning capability is just the beginning. It's not a goal on itself because uh, algorithms are only as good as the data that is fed into them. And uh, information contents of the data is also a very uh, important factor. So you can have a lot of data, but uh, for example, data coming from a broken sensor contains zero information. So this is something that you really have to ca uh, care about. And uh, the data engineering or extracting, the, the process of extracting uh, uh, information from the data is a skill of its own. And you can see that there is some sort of miss, uh, uh, there's some gap between expectation and reality. If you look at the, the blue tasks in expectations, it's like one quarter or even less of the whole ma machine learning effort. And the reality looks like it's closer to, to half or uh, one third. And this is just uh, much, uh, defining the data sets and uh, selecting uh, attributes for data processing and normalizing the data and so on. So there's a lot of effort re regarding the data pre-processing itself. We need to remember that uh, the AI ML is a fast changing game. The, the better stuff is appearing all the time. It's frequent. My own experience with one of the ML met, uh, frameworks that I've been working with was obsolete just in six months. So the same project I tried to run in six months, it turns out that uh, the, 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 the methods within the framework got obsolete. So that's obviously due to, if you re read Ray Kurzweil's books, it's due to a law of accelerating returns. So we, have, we are living in a one huge positive feedback loop where every development accelerates other developments. And this is just one giant uh, for, fit forward loop. Another question is, what solution is good enough? And it is not trivial because the closer you get your models to the perfection, the costs get exponential because you have to use much more training data to get your uh, objectives. But at the same time, the hardware abilities uh, grow exponentially with time as well. So it's really difficult to say, okay, this is good enough. We stop here or we go, go further. So we know that AI is basically about uh, finding patterns or hum uh, finding the missing bits in the, in the pattern. 
but still human must control the process and the results can very easily escape boundaries of the reality. So if uh, you get some sort of results, you really need to verify if they make sense. So there is a famous case with uh, Google owned ML that learned to cheat. Uh, the, the ML was to translate the aerial imagery into maps and back from maps into aerial Im imagery simulation. And the algorithm uh, was able to encode uh, very uh, uh, sub, sub, sub sort of uh, in a subspace, so to say, <laughs> was uh, able to encode uh, certain details and it was sort of cheating. So it was encoding uh, the, the fine details from aerial image into the map and uh, it was able to recreate those uh, details even if uh, you couldn't see those in the maps. So this, this is just one of the possible biases and even inadvertent uh, problems with, with that. So data and its quality, as I was saying, is the most important uh, problem with ML. Uh, and there's lots of lots of problems with data, like where and how to get it, how to minimize the data bias or how to pre-process this, how to treat missing uh, or partially incomplete data and so on. Then there is obviously the noise in the data and this is very natural, but uh, these days the noise is not really a problem with algorithm. They can converge with uh, really noisy data. There is a problem with uh, the bias I was saying in the data. So uh, it's also very important to make a very close look at uh, the data if it doesn't contain any bias. So there was a famous thing about uh, uh, images recognized, uh, this image recognition system that was analyzing images of people in kitchen. And uh, when there was no face visible, uh, it was a there was a bias towards uh, that the person is recognized as a, women, uh, as a woman, which is obviously a, a gender bias here. So this is all, and this is because, just because uh, this bias exists in the data, there was more, just more uh, images with women in the kitchen than men in the kitchen. So, <laughs> Again, I was also saying that even 80% of the effort of the total effort can get to down to data pre-processing and data engineering. Algorithm, on the other hand, they perform only as, as well as, uh, uh, as, as the data itself. So if there is a, uh, an unseen category of data, uh, the algorithm will, uh, uh, will uh, perform very poorly it will not be able to extrapolate because extrapolation is uh, a different kind of beast. It requires uh, a, a, a reasoning process and uh, all of the ML that is uh, currently at play or most of it is just uh, type one or system one uh, AI that is uh, sort of reactive and uh, uh, you can compare it to instincts. Uh, there is a book by uh, Daniel Kahneman, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow and it explains a little bit uh, the concepts of fast and slow thinking. So uh, current uh, ML systems are system one, which is unconscious, emotional, instinctive, and snap, snap judging, uh, and often comes, comes with prejudice. There is also a very important aspect of a problem with justification or certification, the results. Uh, simply, you can only get, you can work with probabilities. So in places or spaces where uh, it really counts uh, that you are absolutely sure you have to work with some other uh, uh, co accompanying technologies because uh, the, the perception will not give you 100% certainty. And this is just like, like in the real life, you, you really have to make sure, for example, if there is something important, you really have to collect information from more than one, one source to make absolutely certainty about uh, your claim. Uh, Mobica being a consultancy and software services company has this ability to see how the machine learning and AI is being deployed in various uh, markets and sectors. And we have managed to collect some, uh, some observations just based on that information. So in particular, it's very easy to start with. Um, so th the starting bar is kind of a low, low level uh, bar. It's fairly easy to get some models from uh, public model zoos and uh, develop a rough application that will be like 70-80% uh, accurate. But then to uh, get it further, it requires typically a lot more effort. And uh, this is something that uh, 
people need to remember about uh, while building their own models because um, uh, if if you're building your your model that you will be the one to take all that uh, effort to build and prepare the data and so on while when when you are you're reusing the models it's it's much easier and uh, you can you can save a lot of uh, a lot of effort the same kind of models uh, can be reused over very radically different uh, applications so there is a you know the classic cv uh, problem of detection and tracking of objects it can be in in enormous number of uh, disciplines uh, it has it can be applied in a large number of disciplines from from gaming through safety so you can for example detect if if a person is wearing a hard hat or or a vest or a security biology automotive the ADAS systems that, that uh, we are working uh, uh, some of which with which we, we are working uh, are just that and obviously the, there is a very high, high difficulty in getting uh, close to the 100 percent correctness it's just exponential uh, the effort gets exponential with with current methods so there are some common themes when we move on with uh, uh, with uh, from project to project one is the thing i said about uh, uh, being realistic so realistic objectives you really need to know whether there is a there is a, the, the 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 topic that you're working with makes sense to try to apply uh, machine learning so if there is for example a very little information content uh, in the data then uh, it would be very difficult to uh, uh, to to qualify and uh, make a reliable predictor uh, uh, regression, uh, regressor or categorization uh, application. The other one is, uh, as I was saying, uh, whether it's worth building your model or reusing an existing one. Uh, some companies are uh, delivering paid models, uh, like for example, Intel with OpenVINO. Uh, you can get an open source model, but if you pay some fee, then you will get uh, enhanced uh, uh, enhanced model that will be more accurate. The problems with the data, uh, I was uh, mentioning there is a lot of uh, different kind of problems. Uh, some of those can be uh, resolved uh, by uh, uh, lowering, for example, dim dimensionality of the problem. Uh, but sometimes you really st still have to get down to manual or semi-manual and data entry. So, for example, uh, with, with uh, uh, annotation and segmentation of the image, you, you really have to use manual uh, manual input, but then at the, on the same time, uh, on the, at the same time, you can use, uh, like uh, for example, Amazon Mechanical Turk service to 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 make this work parallel and uh, and efficient. Uh, in, in case you still have a problem with the data, you don't have the data, you can use uh, generated data. It's uh, the quality of it is not all that good, but uh, still, you can you can work with it uh, as as a first step. And then try to refine your your models further. Uh, there is uh, an obvious uh, drawback from ML. There is no possibility to explain the results from from ML, and this is a big problem, especially if with uh, this disciplines where you really have to certify the response of your system. Uh, so, for example, if if we talk, for example, about autonomous driving and and Tesla, which is very popular in Norway. Um, so Tesla bets on uh, having able, uh, having been able to achieve statistical correctness with what they have in terms of uh, both hardware and uh, and software and uh, their uh, per perception uh, system. So the, the the bet is that uh, they will be able to uh, reach statistical uh, statistical uh, co correctness uh, that is within the tolerable uh, tolerable uh, or acceptable uh, levels. And this is a uh, bet because uh, you don't really know where this uh, breaking point lies, whether it is still whether you need to have a bigger hardware, whether you need to have a bigger uh, data source. It's all very difficult, and so and therefore this is a little bit of a bet that they are doing. But uh, they they are they are doing it anyway, and uh, this is how it how it will uh, progress. So obviously it is possible to find loopholes in the rule-based system that uh, most likely they are building. Uh, so there is a, percept a perception uh, part of the system, and then there is rules that, uh, that uh, work with the perception. But there will be always some gap for uh, unexpected situations. So 
you can imagine, uh, for example, a, a, a balloon with a, a car-shaped balloon and, and ask how the full self-driving uh, uh, algorithm will behave when something hovers on uh, uh, above the road and how, how the car will behave. Because it's probably it it is not there is no rule for that and uh, there there is no certainty which rule will actually uh, be applied uh, for, for that purpose. So uh, there is a, there is an interesting initiative uh, that uh, the the problems with uh, with AI are uh, being reported in the incidents database these days. So. Um, there is a, a database where uh, there's already a thousand of types of uh, uh, incidents that were caused by in, in improper behavior of uh, of uh, uh, AI, and this really is interesting and uh, helpful if you are building your own system to learn from the lessons learned from from the other uh, uh, companies that were building their own solutions and see what could wrong what could go wrong because sometimes it's very hard to predict the. The, the loopholes that, uh, that are there in your systems. Uh, One minute. Yes, one minute. Okay, um, so uh, I have uh, a number of, uh, of case studies that I can just quickly scroll through. Uh, we, we've worked with, uh, for example, RealSense technology, which is a 3D camera, uh, and that was used uh, uh, to uh, perform uh, tracking of people and um, uh, on the large areas where there are multiple cameras and you have to have the, the tracking that is uh, able to hand over from one uh, camera, camera view to the other. And it, it works uh, well with a high number of people. Like there is a crowd, for example, uh, uh, squeezing through some entrance and you really need to track each person uh, very carefully. So this 3D, uh, 3D camera uh, solution uh, we prepared was uh, was was working with this kind of uh, uh, things. Uh, we worked with, uh, for example, uh, an XP company on the, uh, showcasing their new uh, IMX8 uh, processor. So that we developed a game uh, that was played during the uh, uh, FTF event, and uh, that was uh, yeah paper, scissors, uh, rock game, uh, very simple. It was recognizing uh, the image from two cameras uh, at the same time. Uh, we worked with uh, Facebook on uh, their portal device. So there was some tracking of, um, of the objects uh, in the video stream that we were working with uh, um, that was uh, used for navigation. Uh, we worked with um, uh, companies like Evoca that uh, we developed a touchless UI. So it was like a gesture controlled UI for their vending machine um, and, uh, and so on. So th there is, there is some, uh, some others uh, that uh, I, I will not uh, be able to uh, discuss, but uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, uh, it is, uh, obviously it is complex to, to start working with, with machine learning, but uh, it is manageable if you adjust your expectations right. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Um, is there any questions? Just uh, unmute and ask. I have one question. Um, um, otherwise, where can we get educated on ML <laughs> or machine learning and AI? Um, Different schools uh, um, um, have this uh, offering today. Uh, you just ha has to to uh, search on the website on that city you're in or where you're gonna uh, study. Uh, we also try to influence uh, the the different schools in uh, our region to start uh, uh, what we call in Nor uh, Norway after uh, the training. Uh, to get them to uh, uh, set up courses that people who has already been a developer for some years can go further on to study. <clears throat> um, if not, there is any questions from the audience? Then I will thank everybody for participating and a special thanks to, to the presenters.
Thank you very much and have a nice evening.